So I'd just like us to open our hearts to the Trinity. And just like to pray, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a longer prayer uh, that starts that way. You can look it up and if you want to read a longer prayer. I've got a whole lot of prayers to the Holy Spirit. I'm doing a novena of the Holy Spirit. What I do, I've been doing it for the last few years, is from Jose Maria Escriba. I really like it, uh, but there are a whole lot of different ones available. And But the Holy Spirit really is the power behind all of the sacraments here, you know. The Holy Spirit is, Jesus said, i got to get out of here, i got to go so that the Father can send the Holy Spirit to you guys, you know. And we'll look at some of the scriptures on that here in just a second, but... But I wanted to cover basically the sacraments first, and uh, first of all, the this, the word sacrament means really it just means a holy thing, okay? And in a lot of the early church writings, and even today, you'll see them just. Referring to the church as a sacrament. The church itself as a sacrament, a holy thing. And the early church fathers, you'll see them referring to a lot of things as a holy thing, you know. Especially the Eucharist. Uh, they'll, they'll refer to it in their writings as the holy thing, you know. That's a sacrament. It's a holy thing. At some point, you know, of all these holy things, you know, we could say holy water is a holy thing, Right? But we differentiate between sacraments and sacramentals. Okay, you see, it's the same root, sacrament. And holy water is a sacramental. So it's still a holy thing, right? But it's at a different level from the sacraments. Okay? So um, the church finally based, basically just landed on seven sacraments, okay? And we'll talk about them right now. We've got three sacraments that are sacraments of initiation. Okay, these are sacraments of initiation. Um, and what would those be? What's the first sacrament of initiation? Baptism. Baptism, of course. No, we cannot receive any other sacrament prior to baptism. Okay? That's that, that baptism is the sacrament in which we enter into the church. So it's just like entering through the door of the church. And that's why you'll see in, in here, um, you'll see in the church that the baptismal font is over there by the door, right? In some churches, the baptismal font is outside the doors, okay? So it's out there in a breezeway or place out in front of the doors of the church. So... Before you come into the church, you have to go through the baptismal font, right? That's, that's our entryway into the church. And if you read, well, I can give you a whole list of scripture passages, but I'm not going to go through there because y'all don't want to read them for me. So, um, in which, uh, and especially in the Acts of the Apostles, you start looking at people come, well, what, well, what? okay, they hear the word being preached by the apostles especially, they come in on Pentecost, they come out on fire, they're breathing fire, and everybody's going, wow, okay, how do we become one? Well, be baptized, you know? That's what they keep saying. They always say, get baptized, you know? Or, you know, okay. That's the beginning. Baptism's the beginning. It's all over Scripture. We become Christians through baptism. And in baptism... All of the sacraments are ways that God shares his life with us. See? That's what the sacraments do. They're God sharing his divine life. Jesus came and he assumed a human nature. He's a divine person. He's God. 
He's not, a, he's not a human person. He's a divine person. He's God. But he assumed our nature. So he's a, he's a divine person. He has two natures. He's got his divine nature and his human nature. Okay? And, uh, but he assumed our human nature to become, so he could become like us so that we could assume his divine nature. And, he, and we do that through the sacraments. By him sharing his divine life with us. You know? And some people, some people think it's sacrilegious. There's a difference. There's a difference between the way we are as Christians, we understand our assuming divinity through a sacramental life, as opposed to like the Mormons, who believe that you can become a god too, you know, of your own little planet and populate your own something. That's not what we believe, you know. When we talk about becoming God, we become one with the only God there is, the God of the whole universe, the one creator God. We become one with him, you know, and that's how we assume divinity. We're, in, we're invited into that life to share that life of God through sacraments, yes. So, so with the sacraments, though, that's how we receive our grace, too, right? Well, yes, in future, grace, yeah, so grace, so what do you, what would you call grace? What would you say grace is? Well, we receive communion, we receive part of Christ. Okay, you're part of Christ, right? Yeah, yeah so, and, 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 and that's just, that's kind of the terminology we use, but, you know, in truth, we receive not just a part of Christ, right? We receive the, uh, everything that he is. Now, we may not utilize everything that he, you know, brings to us. We can receive a sacrament, and if we're not well disposed to receive the sacrament, we're not going to gain all the benefits from it that we should, right? Our disposition before we go to the sacraments is going to make a lot of difference on its effect, its efficaciousness, right? So, uh, baptism, uh, for a lot of babies, you know, for babies... They don't really have any way to prepare for that, right? So the, the godparents and the parents have to really prepare for them. And it's their responsibility. I just did a baptism last week. It's their responsibility. And I, and I ask them this. Are you ready? Are you ready to do the things that God's calling you to do for this child? Are you going to be responsible? You know? <clears throat> if you're not, you back away, we can baptize this kid later, you know? Because a baby really needs people who love it so much, who love God so much, and love the baby so much that they're going to do everything they can to make sure that that baby is always walking with God in their life. The problem being is that usually the godparents are going to go before the baby goes, right? And then by that time, hopefully, the child knows what it needs to do. So for me, I left the church for a long period of time. But everything my parents prepared me for, everything they told me about, my grandfather was my, was my godfather. And uh, when, when it came time and things were all messed up in my life and I needed to straighten them out, I knew what to do because they had told me what I needed to do. You know, I had good parents and good godparents that... Yeah, we're all, we can all go astray. But just like the prodigal son, he, he woke up one day and he said, oh, hell, there's got to be something better than this. And he remembered his father, you know. He said, you know, I'm better off just to go back and just be a slave for my father than to be a slave over here. Which his father wouldn't have anything to do with that. No slavery around this house. You're my son. And that's the relationship God has with us. He wants to share. We enter through baptism. We become one of his children. And we have the grace to be that through baptism. The other, another initiation sacrament we have here is... Very good. Confirmation. Now, why you said that? Why do we have those? Why is it named differently? Hi, how you doing? Oh, why do we have a different name for them? 
That's a good question. I mean, just, just like we have different names for a lot of things that we do. I mean, but the role is basically the same. The sponsor for your confirmation is somebody that, that you choose um, who should be interested in your spiritual development, right? And basically, they should be walking with you uh, through this process in which you prepare yourself for the sacrament of confirmation, right? This is one that typically, now it's not always, um, it's not always celebrated a while after baptism. In some places, baptism and confirmation, and I think in the Eastern Rites especially, uh, they're celebrated at the same time at infancy. So, you know, it's, it's okay. Confirmation also brings us closer to God through the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a different way from those of baptism. So one of the reasons we postpone confirmation until they're a little older, at the age of seven is what the church considers the age of reason, right? So up until you're seven, just being one of God's children is all you can really do because you're, you can't, you're not really well formed enough to make your own decisions. And, and, and confirmation is a, at a time when you start to reason. And, and so the church has you know, a lot of places, the idea is that they really need this grace of the Holy Spirit to, to not just be one of God's children, but to be a disciple, to go out and to live that life, you know. So that confirmation is a different kind of grace. When, 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 I, when I received confirmation, you may have had the same thing when you received it, um, we, we, used, we had this image of being soldiers of Christ, right? That was the image they told us, okay? Well, you're at a point now, it's time for you to go out and fight the spiritual battle. And I don't think anybody here can deny that that's a battle that we're out here fighting against the principalities and powers, you know. It's not against flesh and blood. The scripture tells us. We're, we're fighting against demons, and, and we need some extra grace. We need more of God's life in us, living in God's life, uh, to be able to handle that. So that's why confirmation is kind of delayed, and usually until you're at least seven. I know at some point in time, I remember times when they would hold off until kids were teenagers, you know. I personally think that's a little bit late. By that time, you could have lost them. They needed that grace long before they went through puberty, I believe, you know. But they do it in eighth grade. Yeah. Is that when they're doing it? I don't know here. I, I, mean, I thought it was a lot earlier than that. I, I mean, I, I was in second grade. And I, at one point a few years ago, we were celebrating uh, confirmation and first Eucharist at the same time. Now, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if we still do that or not. Do we? We do, Teresa? Okay. So probably around eight years old instead of eighth grade. When they, eat, when they attain the age of reason, uh, then we're usually going to confirm them and they're going to do the first Eucharist, okay? Um, and I don't know if we, you know, but, but being predisposed for either of these requires, first off, prayer, you know? We need to be praying before we come and enter into a sacrament. And if we, you know, we receive confirmation once, you know, so it's kind of a good idea that we spend some time maybe doing some fasting, you know, and all, and a lot of prayer before we go and, and receive that sacrament. Eucharist, we can receive every day, you know, but we need to be prepared. We need to prepare ourselves to receive the Eucharist. And fasting is one of the things that we have to do. When I was a kid, you had to fast from midnight the night before until you received the Eucharist on Sunday, okay? So, and I remember waking up, my stomach would be growling, mom and dad, can we stop at the donut shop? No, not until after church, you know. But, and I didn't understand that. Well, in a way I did understand it. We were fasting for Jesus, you know. After we received communion, then we would go out to eat or we'd go home and eat or whatever. So the church now 
only requires us to fast an hour before we receive the Eucharist. So here in East Texas, you know, by the time you leave your house and get to church and they distribute communion, it's probably been an hour, you know. So it's not really much of a preparation. So, you know, the other thing is, in preparing for the Eucharist, uh, are, we, are we those who come in every week, you know, when they're doing the second reading, you know, and on Sunday, just in time to hear the gospel? Or maybe we get miss part of the gospel, you know? Because then all the introductory rites are designed to help us prepare ourselves for the liturgy of the Eucharist, right? We, we come in, we miss the confidior. That's a very important part, you know. But even, even our gathering hymn. And even before that, before the procession to the altar, it's a good idea for us to get to church a little early, 10 or 15 minutes early, you know, and, and just to settle our hearts down, you know, to get over what we just saw on the Fox News a few minutes ago or whatever that's really bugging us, you know. So <laughs> just calm down because God's in charge, right? God's in charge. And no matter what happens here, he's got a plan for us. That's why I love it. I read Revelation over and over and over again. I love it. People think it's the scary book. It ain't scary if you've got Jesus, you know. It's scary for the people who don't. If you read what happens to the people who don't have Jesus, and then you look at what happens to the people who do have Jesus, oh, you know, we got it. We got it. This is okay. It's really a book of great hope. And, you know, Scott Hahn has, has a book out where he, he uses that, um, that book of Revelation. That was the thing that kind of brought him into the church. When he saw the liturgy in the, in the Catholic Church the first time, it reminded him of the book of Revelation, you know, all those things. And he's got books where he explains all of that, you know, so... Um, but this is, this is, these are our, our sacraments of initiation. Um, I would say that just a few, just a few passages from Scripture, um, because a lot of people, especially if we come from backgrounds uh, where baptism is not uh, really considered to be essential. Okay, because there are a lot of there are a lot of people who don't think baptism is essential. But if we look at Matthew chapter twenty-eight, verse nineteen, okay, I, I just want to look at this one real quick. Um, I like I like people because there's so many people in East Texas. If it ain't in the Bible, they don't want to believe it. But there's a lot of things that ain't in the Bible, you know. That, that airplane I'm going to jump on next week and fly to Florida ain't in the Bible either. But I believe, and that plane is going to get me there, right? So, may not. If it doesn't, you'll probably have Father Gavin again after I get through, so don't worry. He's, he'll, he'll be glad to take over. He might even do my funeral for me. Matthew, uh, I want y'all, if I don't, you know, there's enough pieces for them to put me in the coffin. I want y'all to be there at my funeral. Promise me, okay? Pray for me. Matthew chapter 28. This is, gotta remember, this is when they, um, I, I might read a little bit before that too here because uh, I love this. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna begin at verse 16 though. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Isn't that weird? All the things that they saw, all the things they experienced, this guy who ordered them to go to the mountain has already died and rose from the dead. They seen him pass through walls, you know. He gave them the best catch of fish they ever had in their whole life, and they still doubt? You know, really? That gives me great hope. Then Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always till the end of the age. So, so Jesus is saying, how, how are we to go out and make disciples? By baptizing them. Now there are some places, and there's, and there's a, a passage in the scripture where it says, they baptize them in the name of Jesus. So there are some Christian denominations out there who will baptize in the name of Jesus. We do not accept that as a valid baptism in the Catholic Church. So if you were baptized somewhere in the name of Jesus, not in the Trinitarian formula, that would not be considered a valid baptism, right? Because what we believe is that when Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, those are the words that we have to pronounce. And another thing that they've, they've it's been an issue lately, I know there was a priest, um, a lot of the baptisms that he did were declared invalid because he didn't, he didn't say, I baptize you. He said, we baptize you. That's not, that's not the proper. So all sacraments have several parts to them. Um, uh, they have to have matter. All sacraments have matter. And they all have form. Okay? Now, matters, matter is something we could get into some science and discuss about what matter is. You know, I don't think there's ever been a real good definition of matter. We got matter and we, I've, I've heard them, you know, we've heard, I've heard discussions about antimatter. Well, how can it be antimatter when we aren't even really sure what matter is yet, you know? We keep breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces, you know? I don't even know what the smallest piece they've discovered yet is, but they keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But some people, some scientists would say that matter is just informed energy. I've heard that, that description before. Informed energy. That's an interesting way to think of it. If we think of God as the pure energy that formed the entire universe. And that, um, that matter is some of his energy that has been informed. It's been, it's been told what to be, you know. It's been... So, but the matter is important that we have to have the correct matter for the sacrament and we have to have the correct form. And the form for, the, for baptism is the, are these words. It's the matter. What is the matter that we use for baptism? What? Water. Water, yes. And, and that is so appropriate, right? We talk about it in the rite of baptism. We talk about the beginning of the world. You know, when the whole world was void and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, you know, the world was formless and void, but there was the waters and there was the Holy Spirit there, right? All life depends upon water. And so it's appropriate that our eternal life is dependent upon water also. People will ask, well, why did Jesus get baptized? He didn't need to be baptized. One of the reasons he got baptized is because when he went into the water, he made the waters holy so that all the waters of the world would be blessed for baptism. All the waters of the world would be good for baptism after that. Now, um, you know, you have to have water, and you have to say the right words. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You think about baptism? Who can perform baptism? Anybody. Don't you have to be a Christian to do that? No. You mean I can just go grab somebody off the side of the road and say I'm ready to get baptized and they can baptize me? No. Yeah, sure they can. Well, I always thought it was if in case the person was dying, they could baptize Well, an emergency. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. But, but in case of an emergency, anyone could be the minister of baptism. Right. If somebody's dying, yeah. So, so that's something to consider, too. If, if you see somebody's been in a car wreck, you know, and they don't look like they're going to make it, it's perfectly fine to ask them, you know, have you been baptized? If they say no, you can ask them, would you like to be baptized? And everybody carries a bottle of water with them nowadays, right? So 
You could do the baptism yourself and emerge at Jesus and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Anybody can do that in case of emergency. Who are the normal ministers of baptism? Bishop, priests, and deacons. So the, the clergy are the normal, are, you know. Um, so, so baptism is, we got matter and form. So in confirmation, what, what kind, what's the matter that we have in confirmation? Okay, it's sacred chrism, yeah. Well, you know, we got three different kinds of oils that we keep in the ambry, right? And how, how do I know when I go up there, uh, and because we also use sacred chrism and baptism too, or we can, I mean, it's, no, it's not necessarily, you don't have to, but, but I always do because I love sacred chrism. But how can I tell the difference between that and the other? They all look the same. <laughs> how do you think I tell the difference? Because the sacred chrism is a perfumed oil, right? Oh my goodness, it smells so good. That's why nobody ever wants to wipe it off. Man, oh man, this is the best I've smelled all week. <laughs> you know, so the oil is, is and, and so what, what happened in confirmation and what's the form that we use? Well, well the oil's placed on us, right? And, and <clears throat> hands are laid on us too. So, so that in Eucharist, the matter is what? Bread and wine. Bread and wine. So we have bread and wine. Um, let me see here. I've probably got something here. Uh, Acts 8, 14, and 17. Um, I just want to, before I get too far on the Eucharist, I want to stop there. Uh, a, a biblical passage regarding um, confirmation. Acts chapter 8, verse 14 through 17. Too far. Uh, we have here. Yeah, they gave me the wrong passage here, so. Acts 8? Am I in the wrong chapter? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm in the wrong chapter. That's what happened. Okay, so in Acts, yeah, 14. Now, now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who went down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for not yet fallen upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So here's the passage. Here's a passage here that talks about being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's what... Some people will use that passage to justify a form that's not approved by the church, okay? Because this is, Acts is written by Luke, okay? He's just a doctor who's following Paul around, you know? He's a great guy. I like Luke. I've really fallen in love with this guy. But, um, but if I'm going to decide, who am I going to listen to? Jesus or Luke? Or Luke? You better bet it's going to be Jesus. You know, that's who I'm going to listen to. We don't interpret uh, Jesus by, by Paul's writings or by Luke's writings or anybody else's writings. We don't interpret Jesus by their writings. We interpret them by what Jesus said, what their writings are, by what Jesus said. You know, that, that has to be a principle uh, of interpretation. So... If Jesus says one thing and somebody else is saying it's something that doesn't even sound close, it's time for us to break out and start studying. What in the world is going on here? You know, there were things that Jesus said. You know, there were parables that he told. There were things that he said that were allegories and things like that. And so this is why we come to study our faith. 
Because if we start to take everything in the type of literary, literal sense that we understand things, well, most people didn't understand things the same way we did. And it wasn't, in the scripture you could say was written for people of all times in every place. Yes, that's true. But it was written specifically to a specific group of people in a specific time and place. So the book of Exodus was written to a group of people not in the New Testament times, you know? And that's why a lot of the things that we read from Exodus, you know, about laws that were under Mosaic law when they were crossing the desert were particular to a particular time, event, and place of people, you know? And that's proved because in, in the New Testament, the question about um, ritual, ritual purifications, the questions about foods, you know, that are clean and unclean, those come to the surface and they're addressed in the sacred scripture. You know, Peter has to come up and say, hey, God told me, you know, you could go and eat catfish now. Goes, yeah! So that's when we started having uh, fish fries right after that, so. Uh, but this is, I mean, catfish was an unclean food. You could not eat that. Because the fish didn't have any scales. You know? You can't eat fish that don't have scales. There are all kinds of things that you couldn't eat back. You couldn't eat crabs or anything like that. If you were a Jew, a good Jew, you definitely couldn't eat bacon. And that's why so many of the Gentiles were questioning. I don't know if I'm going to be, I said, no bacon? I got a grandson. I'm going to tell you, he has to have bacon on everything, you know? And I understand that. I, we buy bacon by like, you know, 15 pounds at a time. Whenever Super One has it for like, you know, $3 a pound, we go down there and we fill up a whole basket full of bacon, put it in the freezer. But, I mean, and this is, this is a case that people have, you know, people have to stop and think, you know, if there's something that's been part of their life forever and, and we're asking them to give that up, and the early church had to say, well, is this really something that they have to give up, okay? Like circumcision, okay? That came up also in the New Testament, right? There were a lot of Gentiles, you know, that, that a lot of Judaizers, a lot of the Christian disciples were going out because they were Jews, and they're going out and saying, well, if you want to be Christian, this is what we got to do. And these guys are going, what? I don't think so, you know? So, you know, that was clarified by the apostles. Says, no, wait a second. If you, you know, if you haven't been circumcised, you don't have to be. That opened the door for a lot of people. They're saying, okay, well, we could probably, we could, we'll listen a little bit longer to what you got to say, you know? And that doesn't mean that uh, we can just say anything goes, you know? That's not, as Christians, we, can, we, can't, we can't just say, well, anybody can come receive the Eucharist no matter what you believe. We can't do that, you know? Scripture's clear, and Paul even says, you know, there are many of you who, who don't discern the flesh and blood of the Lord, and that's why many of you are sick and dying. And that's why sometimes people look at me and say, Steve, you're like, you're like a, a, a Eucharistic police up there, you know? Because I make sure, no, no, the other thing, being informed, you know? How do we prepare to receive the sacraments? Do we know how to go forward and receive the Eucharist? Right? They allow, you can, you're allowed to receive the Eucharist on the tongue. Um, you're allowed to receive the Eucharist in the hand. But you receive the Eucharist. So sometimes I have people that come up to me and they go like this. I, and I just take Jesus and I hold him back away from them. You know? We don't take Jesus. We don't take the Eucharist. We receive Jesus. Jesus comes to us and we receive him. And, and the early church fathers gave it, I don't remember which one it was, I, I'd have to look that back up. One of the early church fathers gave us a description of how to receive the Eucharist. And believe it or not, I had a discussion with somebody recently who's a very traditionalist Catholic who likes Latin Mass and all that, and that's fine. You know, I grew up with Latin Mass. I received my first communion at a Latin Mass. And it doesn't matter what languages it's in. Some people think it does. They think if it's not Latin, it's not valid, which is not true. 
But people actually receive the Eucharist before they ever received it on the tongue, they received it in the hand. And the early church fathers tell us how to receive it. They said to make a throne. Make a throne with your hand. Right? We, we, we want to go up. We want to make a profound bow or, or genuflect some type of sign of adoration for God who we're about to receive. Make a throne with your hand. Keep your hand open to where I've had people go like this, you know, where I have to try. It's not, it's not right for me to drop Jesus in their hand, you know. I don't, I don't want to drop Jesus. You know, I want to place Jesus on his throne. And then they should take and, re and, re and receive him immediately. So if you're going up there, if you wear a mask when you go to communion, what you need to do is take the mask off. I've got one on, okay? If you're scared that I'm going to give you some disease, I'm wearing a mask, okay? Until they tell me I don't have to wear it anymore. I'm going to wear my mask. You're not going to catch anything from me up there. I've, I've got so much of that disinfectant on my hands. By the time I get out communion, it's probably going to taste like alcohol, okay? But, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm, but, but the thing is, is that you have to be disposed to receive. And don't just be prepared to receive your Christmas. Because I've had people walk out of the church before. I've had to chase some people down before. You know? And, and why? Not because I'm protecting Jesus. Jesus can protect himself. You know, he doesn't need me to protect him. I'm protecting that person. Because St. Paul tells us, those who don't, you know, recognize the body, the flesh and the blood of Jesus when they go forth, are eating and drinking condemnation upon themselves. In the early church, the, the process that we're going through here uh, RCIA was a lot longer than it is here. It could go on for years and years, you know. There were a period of time where they would, people would stand outside the church, you know, and they would just be taught, and they would be taught, and they, would, they couldn't go in. You couldn't go in the church, but you'd stand outside. This might take a year or two before they'd actually let you come inside the church, and you become a hearer. And at that point, all you could do is listen to the word of God, listen to the gospel and the other you know, writings that they would read in the church, listen to the liturgy from inside the church. That might go on for a year or two too. And then before they would finally be admitted to full communion in the church, this could take many years. And then, God forbid you committed a mortal sin, you know. I was reading one of the early church uh, documents one time, and a woman who had an abortion could not go back. She had to do nine years of penance before she could go back and receive communion again. Whoa, nine years. Nowadays, if, if that's a sin a woman commits, she has to go to confession, right? She has to, we have to admit, if we kill somebody, we have to admit we killed them, you know? I'm so grateful for our legislators in this state who recognize that when your heart is beating, that's an indication that you're alive, right? And we shouldn't be just killing innocent people whose hearts are still beating, right? Or just started beating. That's murder. That's what that is. Now, an innocent person. So, fortunately, I mean, it's a serious sin. And yet we have people in this country that are defending this every day, you know? And they want to make it totally legal. That same thing that separated the Christians in the early church. Infanticide and abortion were, were widespread in Roman and Greek civilizations. You know? They, you know, they would not just kill the babies in their womb, but after the baby's born, I don't like his looks. I'll set him out there on the porch. If one of the neighbors wants him, they can come get him or he can just freeze to death. They would die of exposure a lot of times. Or people would come along and take the children, raise them up, and use them for all kinds of horrible things, you know? Either as slaves, sex slaves, whatever, you know? And, and so the Christians couldn't do that. You know, and the dedicate expressly forbids that. A lot of the early other early church fathers. So I'm kind of getting off of the sacraments here though, but 
Uh, but the Eucharist, uh, to be disposed to receive the Eucharist, we go to Mass, you know, we got to remember, it's a sacrifice, right? How do we participate in the sacrifice? How do we participate? Are we putting ourselves, our whole lives, up there on the altar with Jesus? Are we coming forth and giving God everything that we are? You know, Paul, Paul said, you know, look, he's making up for what was lacking, you know, in the sacrifice of Jesus. Well, what was lacking? What did Jesus lack? He lacked our participation. That's what he's lacking. His, his sacrifice was complete. There was nothing that needed to be added to his sacrifice. But what we add is our own sacrifice. We're giving, we lay our life down for God with Jesus because we're part of his body and blood, flesh. So we have to place ourselves on that altar and give ourselves to God as well. You know, that's, that's how we should participate fully and actively. Look at our lives. You know? Where are we not giving ourselves to God? And, and that's what we need to start bringing to the altar with us. Yes, sir. I had a question. If you bring a friend mm -hmm. that is looking for God and feels like, you know what, I want to, I'm looking for God, I want to take the Eucharist when they're in Mass because they feel this emotion of, but they're not Catholic at the time, but they're, they've accepted Jesus. Can they go up there no. and accept it? No. And, and so if you, we, I would encourage you to bring people, you know. Could I ask why? Well, because Jesus didn't tell them, don't, you can't take the Eucharist. No, but, but what, what did Paul say? What did Jesus say? And you just said, what did Jesus say? What did Paul say? Yeah. Well, what so did Jesus say? Out, like, what did Jesus say? Did Jesus say you can't until you do the... No, Jesus taught his apostles. So he gave his, he taught his apostles everything. And then he, he gave them the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And he told them, I said, you're going to remember everything I taught you. And the Holy Spirit's going to teach you everything I didn't get around to. Right? So that's why the church is the ultimate authority. And that's where we have a lot of, of our Protestant brothers and sisters who, who think the Bible is the ultimate authority. And we can address this in another class. Uh, and I've talked about this before, sola scriptura and all, which is not scriptural, but, but the authority, um, Paul tells us explicitly, you know, and if you read the early church fathers, no one was allowed to receive communion until they had been through the initiation, you know, rites, and learning what it is they're receiving, because Paul says, if you don't know what it is you're receiving, you're eating and drinking condemnation on yourself. But if you do know, you just don't have to be well, Catholic. Well, you, it's still a no. Yeah, it's still a no. It's still a no. So here's what I would suggest. This is what I would suggest. And I would encourage you to invite people to come and learn about the faith. But I would suggest you tell them beforehand that communion is closed communion. They could still come forth and they could put their hands like this. And I'll say, okay, receive a spiritual communion. Okay. Somebody, some people say go out and receive a blessing. No, no, no. The blessing is at the end of the Mass. Okay? That's the last thing we do. We send you off with a blessing, right? But they can come and receive a spiritual communion. Right? But they need to go through this process of baptism and, and learning about what it is, preparing before they receive the Eucharist. And the church does this to protect people so that people know what they're doing. So they're not eating and drinking condemnation upon themselves. Why, like Paul said, that's why many of you are sick and dying. You know, We don't want that to happen to people. You know? We want people to be nurtured by the body and blood of Jesus Christ. To be strengthened for their journey. You know? There's so many Catholics who know so little about their faith who leave the church. You know? I, I run across them all the time. And I, here, I, we got a new guy at work. Um, and I've only worked with him a few days. First day, we're working together. He says, yeah, me and my wife, we're looking for a new church. I said, well, have you ever, have you ever been to a Catholic church? He said, no. I said, well, I would suggest that you, you know, investigate it, you know, learn something about it. 
It might be something you and your wife would be interested in pursuing. And he said, well, only thing I know is that y'all worship Mary. <laughs> yeah, I remember we were talking about that before class, right? So here I got to give them the same, I got to give him, he's captive audience. I'm driving my truck down the highway over there in Longview. He can't jump out. I guess he could jump out, right? But, so I just laid it down to him like we talked about Mary the other day. But, you know, I try to put it in practical terms. You know, like we talked about, you know, uh, John, you know, at the cross. And Jesus said, behold your mother. And then I talked about, the, you know, the book of Revelation, chapter 12, you know, where, where the devil goes after her, the rest of her children. And it defines who those children are. Those who keep his commandments, right? The, the members of the body of Christ. We're all her children. And I talked to him about the Ten Commandments. Some of us don't know those, you know. But the fourth commandment is the only commandment that God gave with a promise. Honor your father and your mother so that you might live a long and prosperous life in the land that the Lord God's giving you, right? None of the other, none of the others had promises like that. But, but honoring your father and your mother, my goodness, that's so important. That's such an important, and, and, and under Mosaic law, a, young, a child who wasn't, who didn't honor his mother and father was supposed to be stoned to death, you know, under Mosaic law. I don't know that that ever happened, you know, but if you read it, and then may, maybe it was just written down so that they could show it to the kids. You see this? You see what I could do to you? You know? You know I know some, some mothers will tell their kids, you know, I brought you into this world and I can take you out too. So, <laughs> and that's happened before, sadly enough. But, uh, but honoring our father and mother is so important, you know? Honoring our heavenly father, honoring our heavenly mother, one of the most important things we can do. And you know, and I have to, I always tell them the same thing I told you guys, you know, if you're, if you're standing in front of the judge who's going to determine where you're going to spend all of eternity, are you going to say, ah, I didn't think too much of your mom? <laughs> think that's going to go over well with Jesus? I don't think so. You know, I, I wouldn't say that to Jesus. I wouldn't say that to anybody, really. Even if I didn't think too much of their mom, I wouldn't say that, you know. But especially not Jesus. So, I, I, I think we covered a, a scripture passage. Well, not on the Eucharist. I didn't on the Eucharist. But in John chapter 6 is our best references to the Eucharist, okay. And... Um, and so I was, I was re-listening this past uh, few days to some, an old debate that was done at SMU many years ago. Um, it wasn't really a debate. It was a dialogue between Protestants and Catholics and about the Eucharist and the reality, the, the, whether it's the real presence, whether it's really Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. And a lot of Protestants agree with the Catholics in a sense, in a sense. But then a lot of them say, no, it's not really, it's not really his body and blood. You know, it's a symbol. Well, the, the, the sacraments are signs that actually are what they signify. So, you know, the Eucharist is a sign, yes, but it actually is what it signifies. So, in John chapter 6, this is one of the clearest, and this is a long passage. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, it's after Jesus had fed the, all, all of these uh, people, you know, with the multiplication of the loaves. And, and he says, they asked, what sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What sign can you do? Okay. They, they already seen this miraculous multiplication of loaves, but they're asking, what sign can you do that we might believe in you? And they said, our ancestors ate man in the desert. As it's written, we, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So Jesus said to them, amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. 
For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, well, give us that bread always. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes me will never thirst. But I told you that, although you have seen me, you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, that I should raise it on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes him may have eternal life, and I'll raise him on that last day. So they murmured. He said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Don't we know his mother and father? How can he say, I've come down from heaven? And Jesus heard their murmuring. And he said, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him on the last day. They shall be taught by God. And he goes on saying, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life within you. In John 6, 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. So, even in his time, he never said, no, wait a second, I, this is a metaphor. I mean, no, I'm, I'm just speaking metaphorically. This is really, uh, he never said, stop, guys. Y'all didn't understand what I'm trying to tell you. And the teachings of the church from the first century all the way up to the 1500s were very clear. Now, this truly is Jesus' body and blood, soul and divinity. All of the early church fathers attest to that. Is it possible that the Holy Spirit messed up and didn't show up until the 15th century when Martin Luther and all these other guys came around? Is that even possible? I... You can believe what you want to believe, you know. I don't see how, and, and that's what I told this guy the other day, that, that my new, our new employee. I said, you know what? I said, I'm a Catholic because it's the church that Jesus started. There's not any other church that can tell you that and be truthful. Nobody else can say that honestly. We can. We, we have the lineage to prove it, you know. And no, and, no, and no real historian, no real, even, even, even people who are not even Christian understand that Jesus started the Catholic Church. You get on your phone and say, hey, Google, who started the Catholic Church? Guess what you're going to say? Jesus. I, one time, I don't remember what it was, one of them said St. Peter. Okay. Well, yeah, oh, well, Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Talking to Peter. So it was really Jesus' church. It wasn't Peter's church. It was Jesus' church. And for me, despite all the problems, of the, you know what? Yeah, we got problems. We do. Show me a church anywhere that doesn't have problems. You know? Show me a person anywhere that doesn't have problems. You know? And that brings us to Another set of sacraments here that I want to talk about. They're very important to our spiritual life. We've got the sacraments of initiation. And we could talk about those for a long time. We could keep talking about those sacraments of initiation. Uh, and, but we also have sacraments of healing, right? And there are a couple of those out there. The first one is what? What? Thank you. Woo! I thought you lost your voice. Okay. <laughs> sacrament of confession. Okay. And also it's called sacrament of penance. Uh, it's called the sacrament of reconciliation. There's just, I mean, you could go on and on and on. There's lots of names for it. But really, it's the sacrament of healing. You know? When baptism, we have all of our sins wiped away. Anything you ever done your whole life up until your baptism, wiped away. I asked that guy the other day, I said, you ever been baptized? 
He said, yeah, twice. I said, no, you've been baptized once. The other time you just got wet, okay? Scripture says you're baptized once for the forgiveness of sins. That's what the Holy Scripture says. That's what God's Word says. I know people that get baptized every time they change churches. But all they're doing is getting wet, and that's fine. You know, it gets 100 and something degrees here. Let's go get baptized, guys. You know? So, you know, but, but really, the problem was in early church, and, and Constantine is alleged that he was baptized on his deathbed, you know. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't really become a Christian uh, while he was alive because it was kind of against the law. He finally legalized Christianity because mom was a Christian, you know. <laughs> I can't really, you know, burn mom or feed her to the lions, you know, even though Nero would have done that. But Constantine was a different kind of guy. So he, um, so, and this was a lot, John Wayne was on his deathbed when he was baptized. You know? One of his grandsons is a priest in California today. You know? but, but a lot of people had this idea, well, you know, if baptism wipes away all of my sins, I'm just going to wait till right before I die, then I'll get baptized and go straight to heaven. Well, that's fine if you actually know when you're going to die, you know, if you're that lucky, but what if we walk outside and a bus hits us in the parking lot? Probably not going to happen, but I mean, those freak things happen. Or I could just fall over and die from a heart attack, you know? The, the, even young people, 18 year olds, have heart attacks, you know? That happens. So we don't always know. So there had to be a way we could get people baptized, and, and, and confession, there's, there's probably nothing more scriptural than confession. Um, John chapter 20. Once he's risen from the dead, and I think we've talked about this before. On the evening of the first day of the week, it's what, Sunday, right? When the doors were closed, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. And then he said this. He breathed, when he said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. This so is what he said to his disciples here, right? He breathed on them. He gave them the power to forgive sins. You know, that's pretty clear to me. You know, I don't know how anybody can find any ambiguity in that, you know. And people say, well, I just go straight to the Father. I just go straight to God to confess my sins. Hmm. That ain't really how Jesus said we're supposed to do it, you know. And you know what's interesting? If you read the early church fathers, if you read the, the documents of the early church, how did they how did they do confession? Does anybody know? You stood up in front of the whole church. Now you're only you're only required to confess mortal sins, right? So I get up there. Hey guys, I have to admit, I committed adultery this week. That's just like the other one I was telling you about. You know what happens if you commit adultery? You're back out standing outside for years. And if your wife doesn't kill you while you're standing outside, you might get back into church someday. You know? Everybody knew. You had to confess to everybody in the whole church. Then they can't take the Eucharist. And they can't take the Eucharist. Right. You couldn't do it. No, they couldn't. They start all over again, basically. Because they're in sin. Yeah, yeah. Then, well, they have to go through all these years of penitence. And there was an order of penitence, okay? There was an order of penitence. So you knew who these, they probably had to, you know, have the scarlet letter on them or something like that, you know? The, you knew these people, they were in the order of penitence. They were, they're, they messed up big time and they're trying to get straightened out. That's where 
Tertullian ended up not getting, uh, Tertullian's a great early church father, but the debate came up because a lot of people were denouncing their Christianity. They were denouncing that they were Christians so they wouldn't get fed to the lions. And so the question came up in the early church. They said, well, um, can God forgive them for this? Is there any way that they can be forgiven? And Tertullian says, no way. No way! You can't, they, they can't be forgiven for that. But the church and their wisdom and through the intercession of the Holy Spirit says, you know what? They can even be forgiven for that. Jesus said himself, you can deny the Son of Man and still have salvation. But blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a sin that cannot be forgiven either here or in the next life. You know? So denouncing God for all eternity, you know, to your death, rejecting God even at death's door, saying, no, God, I'm not having no part of you. It's the way God says, okay, I really would like you to come be with me for all eternity and share the beautiful things I have to give you, but I'm not going to make you, you know. I'm not going to make you have bliss. You can continue. And you ever meet people that are so miserable and you try to help them out, but they just rather just steep in their misery I've been that way before there were years in my life when I was begging God to help me to change my life because I got myself in such a mess you know but I didn't I didn't go and do the things I knew that I, that could really make a difference is come back to God go to confession when I finally did go to confession after I'd left the church for 20 years first I was indignant because the priest actually expected me to do penance. What? What? I remember that story in Luke 15. You're just supposed to come running out of the confessional, put your arms around me, put a robe on me, and give me a ring. Let's throw a party because Steve came back to confession after 20 years. No, but he told me what I needed. He told me what was essential for me to become Again, what God had had me in, in his family, you know, to be who he wanted me to be, I had to repent. I had to turn away from that sin in my life. I had to do penance. I'm so grateful that priest. I'm sure he's in heaven. I'm sure he's a saint right now. He, he's passed on. And I, uh, one, he was a, one of those strict old priests, you know, no, he grew up with the Latin Mass too, and when it changed, for a lot of people that grew up, you know, with the same liturgy that had been going on for 500 years, you know, it was a big change, you know. It's a big change. It's hard to deal with, you know. So, but, but, but we, it, the scripture also tell, tells us, confess your sins one to another. Well, I would rather just go in there to and this, this whole sacrament changed. So we can thank the Irish for this because it was the Irish who began auricular confession. That means confession in the ear. So the Irish said, man, you know, this is a little bit too tough. We're not getting enough people coming to confession. Let's change the way we do this. So you can come just whisper in the priest's ear what you did. If the priest gasped, <laughs> then you'll know it's pretty bad. No, they don't, you know, I've never heard, never in my life have I heard, and I've heard people tell me about priests that chastise them and things like that. I've never experienced that that I can remember. The worst I ever remember is that a priest fell asleep while I was telling him my sins, okay? <laughs> and then he woke up and he said, tell me your sins. I'm like, I have to do this all over again? <laughs> Are my sins so boring that you can't even stay awake and listen to them? You know? That's the, worst, that's the worst experience I've ever had in confession, right? And that's not bad. I mean, who knows? That priest might have been sitting in the confessional for 14 hours. Padre Pio did that. You know, the cure of ours did that. You know, he would sit in the confessional day in and day out. You know, people came from all over Europe just to go to confession. This guy, St. John Vianney, amazing priest. So um, this is how... This is how we uh, restore what we lost, you know, if we commit a moral sin, what we lost from baptism. And 
would go to confession. And when you come out, if you were honest and you confessed everything you couldn't remember that was a mortal sin, you know, if you've been if you've been gone a long time and you've committed so many mortal sins you can't remember them all, I mean, we understand that. Do the best you can. You confess everything you can, you know? And then if you walk out later and say, oh, I forgot that, it's okay. You forgot. If you, try, if you didn't just deliberately leave it out, if you confess everything that you remember the best you can, your sins are all forgiven, you start all over again, man, that's a great feeling. So what other, other sacrament of healing do we have? Did you raise your hand? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will call on you, man, I will. I'll do it. Okay, anointing of the sick, right? And I'm just putting anointing of the sick. So, an anointing of the sick. In James chapter 5. Verse 15. I love this book of James. I read it over and over again. It's so powerful. It's a short book. It's got so much in it. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone in good spirits? He should sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? He should summon the presbyters. Now who are those? Priests. priests. Summon the priests of the church and they should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Now, it doesn't say he's going to save him from his physical ailments. It just says he'll save him, right? We may lose our body. And what does it profit a man if he, if he gains the whole world, but he loses his very soul, right? Nothing. The most important thing for us is to get to heaven. If I have to give up everything I've got, you know, even the wood in my garage is now worth about five times as much as it was a few months ago, you know? So... If anybody bought two befores lately, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. But um, I can I you know, there's nothing I have. There's nothing I own. There's nothing here on this planet that is worth me sticking around here for. I'm telling you. I love you guys, but I know I can do more for people in heaven than I can here. <laughs> so. You know, if I'm anointed, and, I, and I've been anointed several times, so I've, I've been, uh, I've been up there in the, uh, in the hospital in the intensive care unit twice. One thing I know, the first time I had insurance, and I went both times for the same thing. The first time I had insurance, it took ten days to get me out of. It. The second time I had insurance, I was healed in three days, which just goes to show, you know, you, you get well a lot faster if you don't have insurance. I think they, uh, once they, the insurance, you don't have insurance? How do we get this guy out of here, you know? We know that's how it works. We, uh, we know that's how it works. So, anointing of the sick, it's a great, wonder, it's a wonderful sacrament, you know? Don't be afraid. If, you're, if you feel like you're deathly ill, with all this COVID stuff going around, you know, some people get it. They, they don't go through too much. Maybe a little fever, a cough, whatever, they're back to normal. That's fine. Some people get deathly ill, you know? I know several people died from it. So um, if you're not doing well, if you get it, you've been sick for a while, and it doesn't look like you're getting any better, call the priest by all means and get him to come and anoint you, you know? Uh, that's one of the sacraments I can't. So I can, I can go out and I can do baptisms and I can do weddings and I can do funerals, okay? The funeral's not really a sacrament, though, okay? But I can do baptisms and weddings. So, uh, but, I, but I can't, the reason I can't do anointing is because that's not the function of the deacon. That's the function of the presbyteral, okay? The presbyterian. They're, they're the ones who minister sacraments of healing and the Eucharist. I can assist them. I can assist them with these sacraments, 
And that's my job as a deacon to assist the priest and the bishop. I work for the bishop, assisting the priest of his diocese. And so I can help them. If they need somebody to come help them, you know, I, I can be there to help them. But that's not something I can do. I can't anoint you. I can pray over you. I can pray for healing, you know. So we can, you know, and, and the prayers, prayers are always helpful. So anointing is another sacrament of healing that's based in Scripture, right? Okay, we got, uh, we also have a couple of sacraments of vocation that are, um, The healing also, the anointing of the healing be the healing of the person who's living a sin, like living in sin, not just physical? Yeah, okay, so basically that's what he's really, he's really, uh, when you look at that passage, it seems to me that that's what he's really talking about. And he says, if anyone is in sin, then their sins will be forgiven. <clears throat> he said if you're sick, <clears throat> and there could be different kinds of sickness, you know, yeah, you could have, yeah, you, yeah, you could have mental illnesses, you know. But usually the anointing of the sick is, is given to people who are in danger of dying, okay? Spiritually or physically? Physically, physically dying. But it also incorporates spiritual healing with it. So if you're, if you're spiritually dying, the first place to go is the sacrament of confession, you know. And I know that sometimes that takes a while before we can, I mean, um, it's not easy. But I know the more that I go, the easier it is. And I've just gotten to the point now because it doesn't do any me. I, I used to think, oh, let me go to a different parish. Or, you know, all the priests know me. I'd have to go to a whole different diocese to find one. No, so I'm not, you know, I used to, I'll, I'll disguise my voice, you know. I'll disguise my voice so they don't know who it's me. Now I'm just going, oh, Steve, it's you again. <laughs> it's the same list you gave me last week or what? No. It's not that bad, but you know, um, just just to go. The more often I go, the better it is for me. Even though I may not have committed a mortal sin, right? I still commit sins every day. They don't have to be mortal to be detrimental to my spiritual life. So, and it makes it easier if they're not mortal sins. You know, you think you know. <clears throat> this is not one that I'm going to go to hell for all eternity, so, so that makes it a little bit easier to, to confess them. But, but the ones that really give you the relief are the big ones, right? When I came back to church after 20 years, what a relief. And there was Father Joe Strickland here at the time. And I remember uh, I asked him, I said, I need to talk to you. You know, I, I made an appointment to be with him. I think he sat there with me for two hours. I believe it was about two hours that he, it was a long, long time. He's probably thinking, when am I gonna get this guy out of here? But, um, but all he did was show me love and he, he started introducing me back to people in the church. You know, I started learning about classes like this. I started going to classes like this, getting involved in prayer groups and Bible studies. I read the Bible. I started reading the church fathers. Because there, there was a guy I met here and down in the basement. We have an RCIA class. He was coming into church too. He'd been a Presbyterian minister for 14 years. And he never could win an argument with his wife. She was raised Catholic. You know, He never could win an argument. She'd take him right to the Bible. And he'd go, oh my goodness. I might as well. So he ended up becoming Catholic. So if you're ever out in Chandler at St. Boniface, you might meet Father Paul Key. Um, boy, He's, he's written books. He's been on, you know, EWTN, on the Coming Home Network on there. He's, uh, he's got some books, you know. Started out, I think, one of the 66 reasons to become Catholic. Based upon, he based that on the 66 uh, Wittenberg Confessions of Martin Luther. But it's grown. It's like 95 or 120 or something now. He's just, he keeps adding reasons to become Catholic. Uh, if you really want to talk to somebody who's been on the other side for a long time, and, uh, you know, Presbyterian minister, why he became, I think Scott Hahn was his, uh, his sponsor when he was confirmed in the Catholic Church. So he's got a lot, he had a lot of good people backing him. But, um, so, um, 
Now, we bring this, we got two, I need to cover kind of quickly. Two of these are, there's, there's vocations, sacraments of vocation, all right? Um, in John chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, there's a story that's not found in the other Gospels. John chapter 2, verse... It's, it's not in any of the other. John's like that. He's got a lot of stories that are not in any of the other Gospels. So, the wedding at Cana. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, I always wonder, is that because the other disciples were invited to the wedding? <laughs> I have to, I'm curious about that. Surely they didn't plan this wedding without enough wine. But then, oh, we didn't think the disciples were coming. You know, who knows how many there were. We, we consider, you know, John always refers to the 12 as disciples. He never uses the word apostle. He doesn't, John doesn't use that. He refers to them as disciples. So it could be 12, or in some places we talk about 70 disciples. In other places, I mean, who knows? How many people were invited that showed up? And they, they said, we're, we got a problem. We need some more wine. And so who did they go to? They went to Mary, right? But the whole story is really uh, Jesus' uh, blessing uh, of the sacrament. of He sanctified matrimony by his presence there at the wedding. So that's, that's what makes it a sacrament. Right? It's because God shares his life with us. Right? God went to this wedding and shared his life and shared a miracle with this couple who were being married. We don't know their names. Right? We don't know who they are. All we know is that had to be a fantastic wedding. Jesus and Mary showed up. Right? The, the, the fullness of God is there in our, he's supposed to be there in all of us who celebrate the sacrament of holy matrimony. God should be there in our lives. Whether we're drinking wine or whatever we're doing, he should be there with us. And that's why so many marriages fail. Is because people go into this covenant relationship without even understanding what a covenant is and without doing everything they can to keep God as a part of that covenant, you know? And, and the bishop is very adamant about restoring um, marriages and families in our diocese and he's even, you know, the words he's saying are going out to the whole world, you know. He just did a, a national family conference over in Dallas a couple weeks ago. They invited him to. I was reading about another conference that he's been invited to in San Diego later on this year. They're inviting, I see him on TV all the time. He's, you know, because he's preaching the message of the truth. Marriage and family are under attack. I'm not going to get into the politics of it because I know you'll chastise me later for that. But there are specific groups in our country that want to destroy marriage and family. And they're doing everything they can to, and we need to resist that. You know? We have to be on the side of God. And so this is important that we really... The other, the other sacrament... A vocation is so we got marriage, we got mat holy matrimony, in which only one man and one woman. That's it. There's no other. There's no other definition of holy matrimony. No matter what anybody tells you. And holy orders. This is another one that's going to get pe that gets people upset. Because only men 
can receive holy orders. Okay? And some ladies get upset about that. But I don't get upset because only women can be mothers. You know? The greatest, one of the most wonderful things a person can be is a mother. That's why Mary is the queen of heaven. That's why she's the most blessed. She said, all generations will call me blessed. Because she is the mother of all mothers. You know? Nobody more blessed than she was to be able to have the son of God. You know? But only men can receive holy orders. And there are three, three different um, Three different forms of orders. You've got the episcopate, which is Bishop Strickland, and presbyteral, which is the priestly. I'm just going to put priest. I think I misspelled that. I before E except after C. I told you I didn't do good in English, right? And and then the diaconal ministry, which is we we don't pay any attention to them guys. Okay. Uh, so. Those, those are the orders. Uh, those are the sacraments there. All the sacraments are sharing. God sharing his life with us. We could talk a lot more about them, but we run out of time. And uh, I, just, I just want to thank everyone so much. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, was, came upon the apostles after they sat around after the ascension. They sat around for nine days praying, hiding out. Because they were scared, hiding with the women in the upper room. And guess what? Man, after praying for nine days, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Like a strong driving wind. And they burst open the doors, and they went out, and they started preaching. 5,000 people. First day. Coming to the church. Coming to believe. We need to ask the Holy Spirit. Coming up on, we're coming up on Pentecost this Sunday. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, to enliven our faith, to strengthen us, to go out into the world. You know, I'm not saying that you have to take one of your employees on a ride, you know, around Longview, you know, two hours and you know, hold him captive while you tell him all about Jesus. But if that's what we have to do to save souls, by all means, let's do it. Uh, let's, before we go, let's, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Okay? In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, y'all.